so uh, he was nominated by Stephen Cundiff. And uh, Albert is going to talk about bright triplet excitons in and phonon coupling in colloidal nanocrystals. So, Albert, the screen is yours. Okay, thank you. Do you see my screen? Great. Okay. Um, thanks for the nice introduction, and thank you again to Thomas and Maxine for organizing this great webinar series. Um, as mentioned, uh, my name is Albert Liu, and I'm currently a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for the Structure and Dynamics of Matter. Uh, but today I'll talk about some of the work I did as part of my doctoral research in Steve Kundis group at the University of Michigan, uh, where we applied 2D spectroscopy to a class of materials called colonial nanocrystals, um, except with a new wrinkle, which is that we performed our experiments at cryogenic temperatures. Um, so I'll be presenting today among the first low temperature 2D spectra of colloidal nanocrystals and discover, discuss some of the interesting electronic and vibrational properties we uncovered in the process. Uh, so what are colloidal nanocrystals? Uh, colloidal nanocrystals are pieces of material whose dimensions are on the nanometer length scale and they're colloidal, which in this context means that they're grown in solution. And specifically, we study colloidal nanocrystals made of semiconductor, which are often called colloidal quantum dots. And in colloidal quantum dots, the quantum confinement due to their small size gives rise to this to discrete energy levels. So by changing the nanocrystal size, you can change the energy gap of the material. Um, and this provides a straightforward way to tune the colors of light that your nanocrystals absorb and emit at. And because of this convenient property, uh, colloidal nanocrystals have found, found applications in many different areas. For example, uh, displays, photovoltaics, and biological tagging, just to name a few. And the motivation for my talk today is that understanding their fundamental optical properties is crucial to rationally designing and optimizing these devices. Uh, but this is difficult primarily due to something called inhomogeneous spectral broadening. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, you can tune the uh, absorption and fluorescence of nanocrystals by changing their size. So for example, here's, here absorption, uh, here's a plot of lead sulfide nanocrystals where you see redshifting absorption and fluorescence with increasing nanocrystal size. And what I want to point out is that these peaks just look like broad Gaussians uh, without any obvious structure on them. Uh, but if you compare the fluorescent spectrum of an ensemble to that of its constituents, you see that these broad line shapes are actually composed of narrower line shapes from the individual nanocrystals. So what this shows is that inhomogeneous broadening dominates the linear optical properties of ensembles. Uh, so now you can understand the difficulties with, with studying the optical properties of nanocrystals. Uh, since the fluorescent spectra of ensembles are these broad line shapes that only give you information about the nanocrystal size distribution, uh, while the fluorescent spectra of individual nanocrystals varies a lot even within the same batch. And if you want to design a device uh, using these nanocrystals, you want to know about their ensemble average properties. Since you don't want to design a device around the properties of a single exceptionally good or exceptionally bad nanocrystal. So here's the situation I described on the previous slide, where you have nanocrystals of different sizes, all emitting light at slightly different wavelengths. And we want to know about their ensemble average properties, but all of their individual spectra combined to give us this broad and homogeneously broad spectrum. Uh, so the question is, how do we unfold this inhomogeneous distribution to get at the underlying homogeneous line shapes? Uh, and the most powerful way to do this is to correlate absorption and emission spectra, uh, that is, if our sample absorbs light at a certain wavelength, what wavelengths does it emit at? And this is what 2D spectroscopy does, where we get a 2D spectrum that looks something like this, where the y-axis is absorption frequency and the x-axis is emission frequency. And in the context of colloidal nanocrystals, each point along this diagonal line where uh, absorption equals emission roughly corresponds to nanocrystals of a certain size. And the line shape in the cross diagonal direction uh, reflects its homogeneous properties. Uh, but of course, 2D spectroscopy of colloidal nanocrystals isn't a new idea and has been performed by many groups around the world. Uh, but almost all of these experiments have been performed at room temperature. And the issue with room temperature spectra is that peaks are severely affected by thermal line broadening uh, to the point where the homogeneous line width often becomes comparable to the inhomogeneous line width. So this was our motivation uh, for performing these experiments at cryogenic temperatures. So today I'll present uh, results on two different types of nanocrystals that we studied. So first I'll dis discuss an experiment that we performed on conventional cadmium selenide nanocrystals, where we discovered some interesting aspects of exciton coupling to acoustic phonon modes. 
And then I'll discuss our experiment on cesium lead iodide perovskite nanocrystals, uh, which is a brand new type of uh, clodal nanocrystal first synthesized in 2015. And here we studied their bright triplet exon fine structure, which is one of the most intensely studied topics in the field right now. Uh, so as promised, I'll start off with acoustic phonon coupling and cadmium selenide. And these results have been published in journal physical chemistry letters at this reference here. Uh, so our cadmium selenide nanocrystals were provided by Wang Ki Bay's group at Sung Chung Kwan University, uh, which consists of a two nanometer radius cadmium selenide core inside a 2.5 nanometer thick cadmium zinc sulfide shell. And this is what's called a type one heterostructure, which means both the electron and hole are confined to within the cadmium selenide core. And the exon bore radius in, in cadmium selenide is around 5.4 nanometers. So this means that the uh, exon energy level structure is largely determined by the size confinement. And to study these nanocrystals at low temperature, we suspend them in a, in a liquid called heptamethylonane, which is a long branched alkane that forms a transparent glass at temperatures below 100 Kelvin. So you can see a picture here of our sample before it's loaded into a cryostat. So now I'll discuss some of the 2D spectra that we've taken of this uh, of these nanocrystals. And where here, the black, this black curve on the bottom of the 2D spectrum represents our excitation laser spectrum. Um, and on the right is a cross diagonal slice taken along this red dashed arrow. And there's two main features that I want to point out. Uh, so the first is this narrow peak in the middle called the zero phonon line. And like the name implies, it represents the exton resonance without any phonon-assisted transitions. And the second feature is this broad pedestal uh, due to coupling to low energy acoustic phonon modes. And here notice that the, the x-axis is emission energy minus absorption energy. Uh, so now I'll, I'll play a video that shows how the spectrum changes as we increase the temperature from 3.75 Kelvin. So as you can see, the main thing that happens is that the pedestal gets bigger due to more and more acoustic vibrations being excited in, the, in these nanocrystals. And because these nanocrystals are so nice and well-defined, uh, these, these pedestals are so nice and well-defined, we have the opportunity to really sensitively characterize uh, electronic coupling to acoustic vibrations in these nanocrystals. Uh, and because these line shapes uh, are so complicated, there's no convenient equations that we can fit to. Uh, so to extract quantitative information, uh, we need to simulate our 2D spectra. Uh, and to do so, we first need to decide on a model to, model to simulate. So for solids with a diatomic basis, such as cadmium selenide, uh, there are two types of vibrations. There are acoustic vibrations in which adjacent atoms in your lattice oscillate in phase and optical vibrations in which different atoms of your basis oscillate out of phase. And optical vibrations are clearly higher in frequency and energy. So the pedestal feature in our 2D spectra are due to acoustic vibrations. And in a nanocrystal, there's an additional aspect that we need to consider, which is the nanocrystal geometry itself. And there are basically two situations that can occur. Uh, so if uh, the sound velocity of your nanocrystal and surrounding matrix are similar, acoustic vibrations will propagate uh, across the boundary between them. And the acoustic phonon modes will uh, form a span a continuum of energies, just like in a bulk crystal. Uh, if the sound velocities are mismatched, however, uh, acoustic wave will, waves will reflect at the boundary. So if you imagine an acoustic wave originating from inside your nanocrystal, the reflections at the boundary form standing wave modes, where your nanocrystal starts to breathe and contort. And we call these discrete modes because their vibrational energies are now discrete. And I'd like to propose a theory, which is that uh, these discrete and continuum modes can actually exist simultaneously. And although from what I just told you, this seems impossible, there's actually an, an additional type of discrete mode I haven't told you about yet, uh, which is called a torsional mode. And it's easiest to just show you what this is. Uh, so here on the right, you can see acoustic phonons propagating in and out of the nanocrystal since the sound velocities are similar. And here's an example of a torsional mode in which two halves of the nanocrystal oscillate back and forth against each other. And if this picture isn't clear, if you've ever seen a wet dog drying itself off, you can imagine this nanocrystal drying itself off and uh, you'll get the idea. And this is just one example of a torsional mode, but in general, torsional modes are vibrations that don't change the volume occupied by the nanocrystal. Uh, so now we can construct a model based on this theory. Uh, 
So first, we calculated all the torsional mode eigenenergies based on our material parameters. And because the torsional mode eigenfunctions are spherical harmonics, uh, they're indexed by L and N. And if you recall the cross diagonal slices from before, there were these sharp peaks on either side of the zero final line. And it, it turns out that the L equals two mode, which is the torsional mode that I showed on the previous slide, has a vibrational energy that matches perfectly with this. And for these vibrations with discrete energies, we, dis we use the displaced oscillator model, uh, which gives you ladders of states separated by the vibrational energy. And because your transition dipole decreases the farther up you go in each ladder, we keep only the lowest two states in each ladder. And this four level system would then couple uh, to the bath of acoustic phonon modes. And when you have this uh, level system with discrete energies, the effect of a bath is primarily to move the energies, uh, energy levels around and modulate the energy gap in time. So the way we model the effect of the bath is by a quantity called the spectral density, J of omega. And you could think of this as the uh, frequency spectrum of the energy gap mo modulation. So here are the results of simulating this model, which were quite successful. Uh, there's two main things that I want to point out. So the first, um, uh, so the first is that the equations that we use for the dephasing line shapes uh, have a temperature dependence built into them. So we use the same simulation parameters for each temperature. And the second is that uh, our laser spectrum has a finite bandwidth compared to the inhomogeneous uh, line width. So we only measure uh, the the optical response within our laser spectrum. And this can distort our 2D spectrum, uh, especially towards the edges of our laser spectrum. So it's important to account for this. And to do this, we simulate an inhomogeneous distribution that's much larger than our laser bandwidth in order to mimic uh, the broad nanocrystal size distribution. Uh, we then take our experimental laser spectrum at each temperature and use that to apply finite bandwidth effects. And to take a closer look, here are cross diagonal slices that we took of these 2D spectra. And you can see that the simulation reproduces the two main features of our experiment quite nicely, which are the uh, growth of the pedestal with temperature and these sharp peaks on either side of the zero phonon line. And for comparison, here are absorption fluorescence spectra that we simulated uh, for identical parameters, where you see that the pedestal is much smaller compared to the 2D spectrum. And this shows that the nonlinear optical response is much more sensitive to signatures of exton phonon coupling uh, compared to the linear response. And just to show you the simulation parameters quickly, uh, the spectral density that we used was derived for a spherical quantum dot and has three, three main parameters. So this first parameter P can either be one or three, depending on whether the acoustic phonons uh, couple primarily by a deformation potential or a piezoelectric interaction. And we found that we could only achieve good, good agreement with the experiment uh, by assuming a dominant piezoelectric uh, interaction. And this parameter A is the exton phonon coupling strength, uh, which determines the size of the pedestal. And omega C is the, the, uh, a cutoff frequency that determines the width of the pedestal and also the spectral density. And for the torsional mode, we use the calculated energy 0.8 MeV and a Huang Ries parameter of 0.6. And with my remaining time, I'll move on to uh, triplet state coherences of cesium lead iodine nanocrystals. And uh, because I don't have so much time for uh, details beyond what I'll discuss today, these results were recently published in Science Advances at this reference here. So one of the most discussed features of these so-called perovskite nanocrystals is their unique exton fine structure. And specifically, uh, this Nature paper in 2018 presented evidence that the exton band edge in these nanocrystals is comprised of a dark state and three non-degenerate bright triplet states, which are, which are usually called X, Y, and Z. Uh, and what's so unique here is that the dark state is highest in energy, whereas in other nanocrystals, the dark state is always lowest in energy due to the electron hole exchange interaction. And this is because in perovskite nanocrystals, there's an additional Rashba spin orbit interaction uh, that both lifts the degeneracy of the triplet states and lowers them in energy. And this was really exciting because this meant that extons being generated in this material could directly emit light instead of first relaxing into an intermediate dark state with a long radiative recombination time. Uh, but in 2018 or 2019, I should say, uh, another paper was published that performed magneto PL spectroscopy on perovskite nanocrystals, 
where they also presented pretty convincing evidence that the lowest exton state in their nanocrystals was in fact dark. So this caused quite a controversy in the field and was one of the motivations for us to apply 2D spectroscopy towards studying the exton fine structure of, of perovskite nanocrystals. So one of the most useful uh, features of these uh, bright triplet states that I've been told you about is that their dipole moments point in orthogonal directions. So to study quantum pathways involving the different triplet states, we varied the excitation polarization of our second pulse uh, B, uh, where we call uh, this top scheme collinear polarization, in which all the polarizations are identical, and crosslinear polarization, in which the second pulse is orthogonally polarized. And here's what the 2D spectra look like for collinear and crosslinear excitation. There's a lot going on, but here we're just interested in what changes between the different polarizations, since this is what involves the different triplet states. Uh, so to take a closer look, we can take these cross diagonal slices along these dashed lines. And you can see that the biggest differences are these peaks in the middle, uh, which correspond to absorption and emission in and out of this, uh, the various triplet states. Uh, so we can go through the peaks that we observed. So first, uh, peak two li here lies on the diagonal. Uh, so it corresponds to absorption and emission in and out of the same triplet state. While peaks one and three uh, lie at plus and minus omega two, so they correspond to absor uh, coupling between states X and Y. While for cross-linear polarization, uh, peaks four and five correspond to coupling between states Y and Z. And above these cross diagonal slices, you can see calculated uh, relative peak intensities that agree well with the experiment. And an odd feature of these, uh, these spectra is that peaks four and five are much broader than the others. Uh, and in fact, when we fit these peaks to extract the dephasing rates of the different triplet, coherent, tri triplet state coherences, we found that while states X and Y shared sim fairly similar dephasing rates, state Z defays much more rapidly. So our hypothesis is that uh, in cesium lead iodide nanocrystals, the dark state lies in fact in between states Y and Z, which would greatly increase the dephasing rate of state Z by introducing an additional uh, non-radiative relaxation pathway. And this is corroborated by single nanocrystal studies of nearly identical samples, uh, which observed polarized doublets separated by omega-2, corresponding to emission from X and Y, but never a third peak split by omega-1, uh, which is because of this quenching of the emission by the dark state. And because we observe these triplet state coherences in the 2D spectra, we should, in principle, be able to generate and measure coherences between the triplet states as well. And these inter-triplet coherences would show up as sidebands in what are called zero quantum spectra, which are acquired by uh, scanning and Fourier transforming along this intermediate time delay, uh, capital T. And first, we took these zero quantum spectra as with collinear excitation, uh, but we actually didn't observe any electronic sidebands. Uh, while we did observe many vibrational sidebands, uh, which I won't show here, but I have an extra slide on those uh, if there's interest. And this is what the cross linear zero quantum spectra look like, where we see uh, two clear sidebands that indicate coherences between states Y and Z. And here uh, we have slices taken along this red dashed line as a function of temperature, which show that these intertriplet coherences are robust against thermal dephasing, uh, since their line widths don't increase uh, as we increase the temperature up to 40 Kelvin. And we can, of course, fit, a sl fit these slices, for example, at 20 Kelvin to extract an intertriplet coherence time of 1.36 picoseconds. And to motivate a possible application of these intertriplet coherences, uh, I'd like to draw an analogy to valleytronics and 2D materials, where circularly polarized valleys in the band structure are used for quantum information. And uh, even though the, the dephasing times in these 2D materials are quite short, it was shown last year uh, uh, in 2019 that one could transfer the exton polarization from one valley to another within the single cycle of a uh, ex terahertz excitation pulse. Um, so you can imagine performing similar operations on perovskite nanocrystals, where you would have a linear instead of circularly polarized initialization and readout, 
And if you compare the intervalley coherence time, for example, of 98 femtoseconds in tungsten diselenide to the bright, uh, to the intertriplet coherence time that we measure of 1.36 picoseconds, we see that uh, the intertriplet coherence time is over 10 times longer on the picosecond time scale. And maybe this would also have a cheesy name like tripletronics or something. And with that, uh, I'd like to acknowledge funding support by the U US Department of Energy. I'd also like to acknowledge Professor Wonky Bay's group for providing the cadmium selenide nanocrystals and Professors Lazaro Padilla and Ana Flavia Noguero for providing the perovskite nanocrystal samples. And of course, my PhD advisor, Steve Cundiff and the rest of the Cundiff lab. And the rep two references for the two studies that I presented today are here, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. The floor is open for questions. Maybe I can ask a question regarding the first part of your talk. Uh, you had these um, simulations of the uh, pedestals. I don't know yes. if you can get to that slide. I noted that in um, the simulations here, um, you, or, well, maybe I should say in the experiment, the, uh, the, on that high frequency side, you are lower, have lower in intensity in the experiment than in the simulation. Can you explain yes. the difference? Uh, I don't have a clear explanation for it because there's no obvious optical phonon mode at that energy. Um, we also, one thing we actually wondered was whether this uh, um, could correspond to some high, higher excited, excited states such as a biaxon or trion coherence. Um, but we, in fact, I have some extra slides on these actually. Oh, made a, made a mistake. Let me reshare. Sorry for the technical difficulties. So uh, to check this, we actually wanted to compare the complex response of uh, the 2D spectrum. But we didn't see, I mean, any, you know, a, a clear resonance, as you can see from the phase. So where the dashed line is the experiment and the uh, solid line is the exper uh, sorry, the dashed line is the simulation and the solid line is the experiment. So, I mean, this is a long answer for, I'm not quite sure, but uh, yeah. Thank, thank you for the long answer. <laughs> Other questions? Aaron has a question. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, the question is, uh, how much do you see the effect of laser on modulating the exciton phonon coupling in your first half of the talk in the cadmium selenide, I guess? Ah, Because so... in the theory, usually it's not included. It's just a convolution. And the effect of excitation on, on, on let's say, dissipation, it's not included usually. Okay, I, I would answer two things related to this. I think I'll, I'll say one first thing that you probably didn't mean by your question, which is uh, when you first said the expect of the laser, I thought of sample heating. Um, uh, no. Okay, so this is to say that the sample heating shouldn't have been an issue since the pedestal doesn't really change with excitation fluence. Uh, the second thing is that uh, I guess you would mean the effect of a finite bandwidth, like finite pulse effects on the dephasing. Yes, and also in the theory, the laser profile is not really correlated with the dissipation. So this is in the this a kind of deficiency of the theory, if I may say so. The I mean, I would say that the function usually one would do doesn't include any laser effects in the dissipation kernel. So that's what I meant. Maybe I'm not appreciating the question fully, but. Um... We, in a sense, we account for the laser profile in the frequency yes, yeah. spectrum, mm -hmm. right? By, by applying these finite bandwidth effects. It's simply that mm -hmm. we, uh, instead of a convolution, we, sim we go to the Fourier domain mm -hmm. and crop our 2D spectrum. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, maybe we can discuss later. Yeah, yeah definitely. 
uh, I have here more experimental question. Uh, yes. How did you realize uh, all these experiments just in practice, right? So you needed a helium crash that I understand with a lot of glass uh, as the window. So um, did you make a pre-compression of your pulses or overcompensation for the yes. glass? So we took a, we compressed our, we, we had an external prism compressor in order to compress our pulses after the generation in, in our OPA. Um, but we also uh, basically simulated the effect of the window stretching our pulses by sticking uh, sticking it in front of our autocorrelator. So this is this is how we did this. Uh, okay, I see. And then you have uh, the uh, focusing optics uh, outside the kreostat or inside the kreostat? Outside. I, outside. I can actually show a experimental diagram, which I had to omit due to time constraints. Yeah. So here I leave out the cryostat, but our focusing optics are outside. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any problems with the scattering of light? Yes. I mean, this is one of the main experimental challenges. And in the beginning, uh, we tried to study films. But this, I mean, th this the scattering was terrible in these. Uh, so th this is the reason why we use these uh, liquid samples that I showed a picture of and sort of a secret sauce in, in order to minimize the scattering is that when you cool down, um, once you cross 100 Kelvin, which is the freezing temperature of the heptamethylonane, you form basically shards of the glass. And it turns out the faster you cool the sample, the larger the glass size uh, pieces of glass are. So you basically want to quench um, this freezing process and then you can find a nice big shard of glass in order to minimize the scattering. I see, thank you. Okay, do yes. we have more questions? Oh, yes, question. yeah. I've been waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so best question is uh, about, uh, yeah, it's first part of your talk. Uh, by the way, it's a, it's a nice, very nice talk. We probably know it. We also have done low temperature measurements on quantum dots, but only 77K. If I knew it will be so beautiful, narrow lines, we probably would have pushed it for 6K. I don't think we can do four, <laughs> but <laughs> anyway. Uh, the question is about uh, spectra. You, you have these additional features in your spectra above and below diagonal. Uh, what, what are these features? Uh, you mean these sidebands? Yeah. So these are due to LO phonon coupling. Uh, with, and the LO phonon in cadmium selenide is at around 26 MeV. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we, we actually, uh, I, I didn't have time to discuss this, but we, have, we also have a separate study on looking at the yellow phone on coupling uh, in these nanocrystals. And it turns out that they have some interesting non-Markovian dynamics as well uh, in terms, and they're dephasing. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, we also saw them. So I was wondering why you are not mentioning them, but okay, I thought maybe it's something else. Uh, another question yeah. is about, it's more uh, trying to get a physical picture um, why do your torsional modes, what you're talking about, how do we couple to electronic transition? I mean, this is, to me, it's not, and also we, we couple very strongly. You said the Henry's factor 0. 0.6, was it? Yes. So what's the physical picture of, of torsional modes coupling to, to electronic transition in a spherical particle? I mean, uh, this actually isn't so clear to me. I mean, and in a sense that this was sort of a black box in which we just assumed some coupling, but maybe in some rough physical picture would be a deformation potential mechanism, such that you're distorting the exton wave function, and then you're basically modulating the exton energy in this way. But somehow, somehow electronic excitation should, I mean, should, in my mind at least, should, should induce some sort of a symmetry to, to get distortional mode, mode activated, but I just don't see how it can happen. I mean, if you have a 1s exciton wave function, which is spherically symmetric, um, this torsional mode would, would start basically twisting it like a, uh, and, and should induce some sort of energy, energy gap modulation. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the others wouldn't be like, like, like that, right? So you, you deform uh, the lattice, but in a very kind of displaced way. Right, so for the whole for the whole crystal. 
Yeah, something like that, but just a little bit difficult for me to imagine. So that's why I'm asking. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. We, uh, we are more used to, uh, well, this kind of motions, right? Which are, uh, which modulate the band gap directly, right? So that's, that's easier. Okay. Are there any other questions from? I think Vivek has another quick question. Hi, Albert. Uh, great talk. So just a, a quick question. So did you do any cross comparisons of the zero phonon uh, line width, uh, you know, across, let's say, uh, perovskite nanocrystal versus a cadmium, uh, I think, selenite nanocrystal? Because, you know, the environment is quite different between the two. So I, I'm just curious to understand, like, at such low temperatures, uh, a very different environment, does it matter? Or did you see, like, you know, the same kind of temperature dependent broadening of that uh, zero phonon line width? Uh, this is this is in fact a work in progress, but I, what I can say is that they definitely dis exhibit different uh, broadening in temperature. With the perovskite nanocrystals, it's it's kind of difficult actually to extract the homogeneous line width uh, increase because the coupling to the phonons is so strong. Because mm -hmm. the, the, these perovskite nanocrystals are known for having this soft lattice that couple very strongly to the extons. Um, so all I can say at this point is that they they increase much more rapidly, but beyond that, uh, this is still a work in progress. Do you know if it's known, you know, at, at what temperatures does the rotation of the cation start to freeze? Like, I have no idea, like, uh, if... This, I don't know. Okay. This, I don't know. All right. Okay, thanks. Okay, Aaron, do you have a question? Because I, I can I think see your- I hand. Oh, right, okay. Sorry, because I have I... to lower my hand only. Right. Okay. Shall we thank this speaker again one more time? Yeah, let's thank uh, Albert again and let's thank all three speakers. So if you take down your presentation. So before the exciting vote about the uh,